keep the material up to date. So at the end of week nine, I will be putting that as well into your PowerPoint. There'll be a reference list in case anybody wants to refer back to things that we've talked about. Um, we can have time at the end for some questions and answers as well. These are the learner objectives for this week. We'd like you to be able to identify the four evidence-based practices. We're going to discuss more than that, but we'd like you to be able to identify at least four of them. We'd like you to be able to define the importance of effective person-centered planning. We'd like you to be able to talk about and use person-first language. And we'd like to have our participants define the importance of community inclusion. Um, last week, you remember, we wrapped up talking about the community membership model and um, some of the components of evidence-based practices within this model that we're going to discuss today are person-centered planning, independent facilitation, self-determination, advocacy and leadership, self-advocacy, person-first language, full community inclusion for people with disabilities, and a quality of life and what that means. <clears throat> I'd like to start today by talking about disability as it's defined by the law and how people are eligible for community mental health services in Michigan. And I would like to say next week, you're going to learn more about um, some of these evidence-based practices in more detail. Today is meant to be an overview of each of the components of the community membership model, but I'd like to start us out um, with how people are found to be eligible through our community mental health system in Michigan. The Developmental Disabilities Assistant Act, or the DD Act of 2000, was um, kind of put out a categorical definition of disability as it would be defined in federal legislation. And the functional definition replaced the categorical definition in federal legislation. And when we say categorical, it was more deficit-based, um, talked about specific disabilities, um, the functional definition is more like what, what are people able to actually do for themselves, um, how, what kinds of things do they need to work towards, um, and, and how do we define what types of supports they need throughout their lifetime. And so they use the functional definition um, of the DD Act to help identify whether people are eligible for services on the developmental disability side um, in community mental health in Michigan. I think what I'd like to do too is today before I get into um, the DD Act too much further, I'd like to show you um, a little vignette about an individual that is living a full life in the community and so if you'll hold on one second I'm going to pull up our vignette of Liz and show you what is possible. And this is part of our possibilities series. And Liz is a young woman that lives fully in the community with supports and she is living a full life um, included with supports in place with a good person center plan, plan in place and I think that it's kind of a, is a nice story to show you and illustrate how the evidence-based practices today will like support. What the heck? I mean, this can't be happening. It was, I was just, just devastated. We were going to the birthing room and everything was just going to be so peachy and wonderful because we're going to do all this natural childbirth stuff. And, and then she turned out to be breech. And when they did the x-ray, there was a lot of, Oh my gosh, from the nurses, and so I knew a lot was going on. I walked through the doors, they pushed the bassinet with Elizabeth in front of us. It was the moment of my life. I mean, it was instant love like that. Then my husband came in and talked about how beautiful she was and how she looked just like him, how excited to have her, and it just totally, it was, it was like this turmoil of negativity, but yet he's happy, and it's like, well, I should be happy too. 
But I'm so worried about this baby and that this baby is going to survive. We didn't know that she was going to have developmental disabilities at the time, and we thought we were hoping that she didn't. But nonetheless, we just planned that she would live to her maximum potential, whatever that would be. It just kind of went from her birth of being, you know, very devastated to that reality of, wait, I have this baby girl <laughs> that's adorable and happy and pretty easygoing that's surviving some pretty challenging therapies and, and surgeries and now going into school and, and now looking at what education is, which is planning for your future, and then actually realizing that she is competent and has skills. We started learning about inclusion when she was like four years old. We always wanted her included. We wanted her to achieve goals. We wanted her to learn to be socially appropriate and just treated like everyone else. Was that students thrived, that the community became accepting, that um, it opened doors for her as an adult because it would be relationships that would build upon her skills and her abilities and her acceptance. Was 31 years old. She's been living on her own for months. Elizabeth is the owner of this um, condo that we're at, and um, I take care of her. Liz has always had a full-time aid. Liz needs um, a lot of support in the, in the special ed programs. It's almost like a sister bond because I've been with her for so long. A lot of people think that, I was like, no, we fight all that when I watch too much music videos or when I watch a movie and she doesn't want to. Anything that... I would do what she would do too. We go to Panera, grab a coffee, and kind of socialize over there, go grocery shopping, getting things for the house. We go to Target, kind of see clothes, and we go to the mall and we hang out with friends, have a little social gathering here, and um, right? This is, am I boring you, Liz? <laughs> We have allowed Liz to take risks in her life, and because of those risks she's taken, she's done things that Chris and I will say, wow. Liz was a child when she started, so she's been with us many, many years. The benefits are huge, and there are multiples. There's exercise, recreation, social, um, interactive, there's bonding. She has progressed in her riding to that she turns her horse. And she needs to turn when she wants to walk on, when she wants to go. She's a, a very opinionated young woman. She like, knows what she likes. She knows what she likes to do. Progressive and as open as I, we tried to be and our beliefs and everything, we had no idea how much she would progress, how she would grow, how she would change. She has responsibilities in the week. She has to go to work. We start off, we punch in, usually two hours a day. We really want her to be in the public's eyes. We are in charge of pricing and returning the products that people don't like. I make sure that she does the best of her ability. I don't do the job for her. I just make sure that she can do. The first thing that all parents think about, and I think particularly parents with children with disabilities, is their safety. And some parents don't let go. That's easy. Elizabeth doesn't talk. I can't let her go here. She can't go there. What happens if she falls? What happens if this happens? You know what? All those things have happened. She's not made out of China. She's a young woman, and she's fine. And it all has to do with the opportunities that we've given her. And we, we aren't special people. We learned things. We took the initiative to learn to find resources and to find for Liz, to give her experiences and to help her grow, just like you do with any child. And other parents thought that we were just bucking the system and trying to be difficult people because we wanted inclusion and we wanted her to be self-determined and, and give her opportunities instead of just take care of her like some poor sap. And she's not a poor sap. She's a person with a lot of potential and ability, and it's all, it's paid off.
Well, I'd like to I like to show that um, little story about po the possibilities of life. It's Liz's life because um, it's a story that well demonstrates um, some of the evidence-based practices we're going to talk about today. So I'd like to go on now and talk about developmental disability and eligibility and how people are found to be eligible. Um, and this is part of the DD Act here um, that you see in this in this particular slide. Um, your disability is attributable to a mental or physical impairment or a combination of mental and physical impairments. It's manifested before the age of 22. That's uh, very, very key. Um, so if someone has an accident, God forbid, on their 23rd birthday and they have a traumatic brain injury, um, they are not eligible for services under the DD Act in Michigan for community mental health services because they are over the age of 22. Um, it, your disability will continue indefinitely. Um, this is not, it's not, not something that will change throughout your life lifespan. You'll continue to need help and need special supports. Um, and that it results in a substantial functional limitation. Remember we talked about now we have a functional um, definition uh, for, for developmental disability. And it has to affect three or more areas. Of major in your life okay so these are the areas there are seven areas and you have to meet eligibility criteria within three of these uh, self-care this is a person's ability to take care of their day like some people call them uh, daily living skills or ADLs um, you know your ability to eat independently to dress can you bathe yourself? Um, you know, um, can you take care of your toileting skills? Um, receptive and expressive language. How well do you understand what people are saying to you? How much of that do you um, process? And how can you identify and communicate back with people? How well can you do that? Or do you have some, some needs in those areas or have to use some assistive technology or, or other way to communicate? Um, learning. How well do people learn new things? Can they apply the what they have learned to the new situation readily? Or do they take longer to learn things and a lot more repetitive experiences in order to um, process and retain information? Mobility. How, how, how are the fine and gross motor skills? Um, how do people get around? Are they ambulatory? Um, one of the things I was looking at under this particular um, functional limitation of mobility is if a person uses a wheelchair because they are not ambulatory, um, but they don't meet any of these other functional limitations, then they're not eligible for services under the DD Act. So that could be someone with cerebral palsy. Um, Self-direction. How can you make decisions for yourself? Can you set goals? Um, can you determine what you want to do? Um, how self-directed are you with, with money and, and putting your own budget together? Capacity for independent living and self-determination. Can you live independently or do you need someone to help you? Would you be able to understand if there was an emergency in your home and you had to, to leave your home? Um, would you need assistance in those types of situations? Okay, that's an individual's capacity for independent living and self-determination self is a part of this as well. Can you make choices? Can you set goals? Um, so economic self-sufficiency, that one is um, more self-explanatory. You know, can you survive economically on your own or do you need some additional supports? Can you get a job and can you keep a job? Um, can you make a living wage? Or will you need some supports in this area, like a job coach or some special training to help you? And we saw that Liz does work in that vignette, but she also has someone to help her at her workplace and make her successful. And that way, she can be um, very useful at Home Depot and um, you know enjoy her job there as well as providing a, 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 a service there. I think at this point what I would like to do is show you a credo for support before we get into person-centered planning. Um, and credo for support is, um, many of you may have seen it before. Um, I'm here because I'm not able to pull up that vignette right now. So we're going to pull it up. It's about five minutes in length. Um, there is a version of it that 
uh, some of you may be familiar with. It's just words on the screen and there's music. I'm going to show you one today that I found where it's, it's the spoken word version of it. And last week I know some people were indicating they had trouble with some of my clips because there were not a lot of words to it. It was more visual and that's more difficult I think for some people to follow um, throughout the presentation. So I'm going to try to use uh, clips today where we have people speaking and there's also a visual so I hope that that will be more interesting and accessible for people. I'm going to show Credo for Support by Norman Coons and Emma Vanderkip. Throughout history, people with physical and mental disabilities have been abandoned at birth, banished from society, used as court jesters, drowned and burned during the Inquisition, gassed in Nazi Germany, and still continue to be segregated, institutionalized, tortured in the name of behavior management, abused, raped, euthanized, and murdered. Now, for the first time, people with disabilities are taking their rightful place as fully contributing citizens. The danger is that we will respond with remediation and benevolence rather than equity and respect. And so, we offer you a credo for support. Do not see my disability as a problem. Recognize that my disability is an attribute. Do not see my disability as a deficit. It is you who see me as devious and helpless. Do not try to fix me because I am not broken. Support me, I commit my own contribution to the community in my own way. Do not see me in your place. I am your fellow citizen. See me as your neighbor. Remember, don't ever give me self sufficient. Do not try to modify my behavior. Be still and listen. What you define as inappropriate may be my attempt to communicate with you in the only way that I can. Do not try to change me. You have no life. Help me know what I want to know. Do not hide your uncertainty behind professional notice. Be a person who listens the way my struggle for me by trying to make it all better. Do not use stories and strategies on me. Be with me, work with each other. Let that give rise to self reflection Do not try to control me. I have a right to my power as a person. What you call non-compliance or manipulation may actually be the only way I can exert to control over my life. Do not teach me to be obedient, submissive, and polite. I need to feel entitled to say no if I am to protect myself. Do not be charitable towards me. The last thing the world needs is another Jerry Lewis. Be my ally against those who exploit me for their own gratification. Do not try to be my friend. Get to know me. We may do not help me even if it makes you feel good. Ask me if I need your help. Let me show you how you can best assist me. Do not admire me. A desire to live a full life does not warrant adoration. Respect me, for respect presumes equity. Do not tell correct. Listen. Support and follow. Do not work on me. Work with me. Do 
This video is dedicated to the memory of Tracy Latimer. Written and produced by Norman Kutz and Emma Vanderclift. Okay, that um, gives us a lot to think about. Um, and I'd like to us to think about how people become fully participating citizens who do get to contribute to their community. And one of the ways that happens is with um, person-centered planning and um, when it's done um, really well. It is what's beautifully illustrated in that clip um, and we have to listen and support and, and follow people with disabilities really truly in this process. It all started with the Michigan Mental Health Code back in 1995. We were one of the first states to put it right in our mental health code. Person Center planning was going to be an evidence-based practice that would honor individuals' preferences, choices, and abilities. A map, if you will, that people could um, attain their goals and, and live fully integrated lives in the community of their choosing. Um, back in the day, um, back when I started out in community mental health a long time ago, um, back in Ottawa County, um, we thought we had something revolutionary going on. We had I-teams. These were interdisciplinary planning teams. They were made up often of a psychologist, a social worker, a doctor, sometimes a, a psychiatrist participated. Um, everyone but the person with the disability was around that table. And the treatment plan, planning team set the goals, not the individual. They weren't even asked oftentimes what they wanted. Um, and, and most of the time, like I said, they weren't even present at those meetings. And consequently, a lot of uh, planning goals looked like health-related goals, like smoking cessation, weight loss programs, walking programs, and um, you know, had very little to do with what the individual really wanted for their life. Like, did, did they want to go to school and learn something? Did they want a job? What kind of job did they want? What were their hobbies? Um, what, what were their gifts? What were their dreams? Um, you know, and we really focused more on, okay, well, Joe smokes and he shouldn't be smoking. Um, he's a little overweight. We need to get him out every day with the rest of the folks at the group home, take him to the mall. They're going to walk around the mall. Now, if this still sounds a little bit like some of the programs that you might know about, then we might want to think about the things that we're going to talk about more today and how we can change things, okay? Because people, there shouldn't be the pack mentality. It should be individualized. Good person-centered plans allow for individualization. And again, during those times way back uh, 20 years ago um, and more, we didn't really focus too much on the person's focus. But Back in 1995, when we changed the Michigan Mental Health Code, we added person-centered planning. Um, we talked about it as a process, all right, not a piece of paper. Um, we identified that we had to meet with an individual and figure out what they needed to engage in meaningful activities. And ultimately, it should promote a community life and honor an individual's preferences, their choices, and abilities. And we could go into talking about, um, you know, different ways meetings are facilitated. But I think next week, um, Michelle Driscoll and Chesley Geritz are going to talk more about that um, in their presentation. So I'm, again, just going to give you an overview. But we should, good person-centered plans should offer individuals control over what they want to do each day um, and what they don't want to do. And it should in assist the individual in determining what priorities are important to achieving a meaningful life. So I think if we think back to Liz's story, um, what are some of the things that were important to her that are in her person-centered plan? Living on her own, right, in, her, in a really nice condo, um, hiring her own staff who truly like her and respect her um, and like to be with her as well as support her, and her job, right, at Home Depot. 
So these things are identified and we map them out in the person-centered plan. We should always assume competence and strengths in people and sometimes this becomes challenging as people don't always communicate um, <clears throat> traditionally. There are people who don't talk but they use assistive technology. There are people who don't talk and they point to things or um, they you know, use picture boards or different ways to communicate. So we have to figure out how people communicate and work with them so we can get their input into the process. Sometimes behaviors that people are exhibiting are also communication. All right, People say as much right with all people, whether you speak um, or you don't use speech. Um, right, Our behavior is also a way of communicating. We can look at people sometimes and decide if, you know, quickly if they're in a bad mood, um, if they're happy. Well, this is even more magnified with people who don't have traditional speech. All right, my son does not talk, but I can tell very rapidly how, how he likes someone, how he responds to them by his behavior. And after people get to know him for a while, they do understand how he communicates. So good person-centered planning allows for time for the facilitator to get to know how a person communicates and what they're trying to communicate. Of course, we always want to respect people's cultural diversity. And we're going to talk more about that in upcoming weeks as well and how that plays out in, in, um, in engaging people um, with disabilities. And that will be with Julia Hernandez and myself in a few weeks. Um, in good person-centered planning, we want to talk about um, plans that support good health, yes, and welfare across the entire lifespan. So people may live where and with whom they want. So people need to be safe, um, yes, but we also want them to be living with people that they want to live with. If they want to live with someone, sometimes people want to live independently. And we need to try to work with them to see how that can happen as well. Good person-centered planning maximizes independence, creates and keeps um, community connections, creates, uh, if we visit that word for a minute, we have to identify the support systems. Um, those can be people already out in the community and sometimes they might be professional supports. Good plans incorporate non-professional, non-paid supports, people who are in the community that the individual interacts with so that they have um, connections that help them make um, meaningful connections that aren't professionally driven. Um, maybe they have a hobby and so a neighbor or a friend can take them to their crafting or whatever that hobby might be or maybe they have a church that they go to that they like and you know we don't need professionals all the time to um, be active in an individual's life. In fact we know that relationships are best developed with neighbors and people out in the community that are already there, um, families and friends. So we want to make sure good plans incorporate non-professional, non-paid supports. Good plans address the needs of the whole person, right? Their physical well-being, um, their safety, how they feel about their life. They feel good life that we get out of not, we don't mean this in a religious way, but do people feel fulfilled um, and, and feel like that their lives are um, in a place that they want them to be? I'd like to take a minute here now to show you um, another little uh, clip as well before we get into independent facilitation. I'd like to get into um, a little, it's called person versus system centered supports with Beth Blount. It's about two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. I think it's three in identifying system supports and also how you can incorporate it into good and meaningful plans. This is Beth Blount. Of person-centered planning, we were 
trying to understand and see what it looks like when we just fit people into systems and defined their needs and saw them through the eyes of what a system needs uh, for a person to be in order to generate the funding that's required and to basically service them. And system-centered work tends to be based on a medical model which assumes something's wrong with people and it's the system's job to fix them. And so the system is invested in defining them in terms of their deficiencies and creating a treatment plan and then working to help people get it right before they get to be members and be whole people uh, in the real world. So person-centered planning offers a major contrast to that, which is to say that people don't belong to systems. They belong to themselves, they belong to their families and their communities. And if we see them in a different light uh, by the capacities that they bring, and we understand that their communities are the place where they can contribute and be citizens, then our thinking shifts dramatically from how to fit people into systems and service them there to how do we support people to live good lives in community and then how do we take what we need from systems and services so that services are not bad they just tend to be wired for their own purposes for their own self-interest so a good person-centered planning process calls into question the way we use services and invites us to really change the way most of our services are configured to be more responsive to the people and the way that they want to live in the communities that they're in. Contact us for more information for a free demonstration or trial or to sign up. Okay, um, that's an excellent presentation, I think, and a great segue into independent facilitation um, because Beth talks about, um, you know, systems are so that people have a well rounded life. And sometimes an independent facilitator can bring that to the person centered planning process. Independent facilitation um, is Medicaid reimbursable. It's a Medicaid reimbursable service under the Michigan Mental Health Code. And all individuals who receive services in the developmental disability side of CMH are eligible to have an independent facilitator run their person center planning meeting. Um, this means you get to pick who your facilitator is, can work in tandem with the supports coordinator. Um, the independent facilitator does your pre-planning meeting and also facilitate the actual person center plan meeting. Um, they do the documentation and they give the documentation to the supports coordinator who then takes the documentation and um, you know, puts that into the, the uh, official reports um, for their record keeping system. Um, I've talked with us about this process and people who've used it really like it. It gets them away from being the facilitator and getting to be an active, helps them become an active in the person-centered planning process. Um, we, we do a lot of independent facilitation training um, from the Developmental Disabilities Institute. We've also done a lot of independent facilitation training at many of your agencies. Um, and we have found that people are beginning to embrace this process. Um, abilities who used an independent facilitator, they really seem to enjoy the process. Um, it gives you kind of a different perspective. Um, uh, and I think that sometimes it can be more effective because not only do, not only does the independent facilitator know that, that agency offers, but they also often live in the community and they know other, um, you know, supports, informal. And I think Beth Blount referred to that as being a very effective way of, of developing a well-rounded plan when you think of the system, okay? Um, and again, I did mention that it was a Medicaid reimbursable system. 
So that independent facilitator um, is that person's guide and sometimes their voice for people who don't talk, like my son Robert, um, they would have to get to know him and then they have to work with him and, you know, help identify through that process what he would want for his goals. Um, and we want to always make sure that a person's hopes, interests, and desires, and preferences, and concerns are heard and addressed. Um, so there, an independent facilitator is a component of the person-centered planning process. Okay? It's not a program, it's um, not a document, it's a person that facilitates the person-centered planning process other than the support coordinator. The person with a disability chooses who the facilitator will be. Some agencies on their website, if you look for or you type in independent facilitators, it will bring up who they've trained um, in independent facilitation. And I know Mork Incorporated even has biographies on people that have been trained. So you can read a biography about a person who's an independent facilitator that is a non-formal employee of that particular agency. And you can see, well, they have a real interest in jobs. Um, they've got a lot of experience in developing jobs and, and helping people get jobs. And you might be a person who wants a better job or a different job. So you're going to maybe pick that person as your independent facilitator because they have a similar area of interest as you. Um, it assures that the consumer, independent facilitation assures that consumers have someone to support them in the process. Not that support coordinators don't do that because they do, but it brings in a different person, a new focus, and it sometimes can bring some freshness to a process um, and, a, and, and maybe a little bit different results might um, be achieved because of, of that, an independent person coming in. So an independent facilitator focuses on the individual, asks them, what do you want to see happen? Um, what kind of supports and services do we need to identify to make your desires, to make your goals happen? What are the services we can find? No, and what kind of personal outcomes do you want as the, as the end result? Of course, we revisit it every year um, as well, and, and they're changed um, to meet, to, to kind of take out goals that have been met and identify new goals that want to be met. Because as we know in life, people's goals are continually changing. Um, you know, person centered planning is, is just kind of not a new thing. If you think about it, there are so many books out in the library and um, you know online books about uh, self motivation and self improvement. And a lot of the uh, big names that you would recognize in motivational and, and inspirational um, literatures, like Stephen Covey, that's really the principle of self determination in action: is writing your goals down, carrying them with you and then changing them and have a short-term goal and a long-term goal. So the principles of self-determination are not unique to people with disabilities um, but because they really are applicable to everyone. And we want to make sure that as we do uh, meaningful plans for people, whether we use an independent facilitator or not, that we're looking at what that person really wants to get to to live a quality of life. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. Um, I'd like to go on and just do an overview of self-determination. Again, next week's presentation is going to get into a lot more detail. Self-determination, again, is applicable to everyone and not just people with disability. Setting goals for yourself, making choices, and exerting control over what you really want. People need to address six critical elements on the journey to self-determination, and we can start with freedom. You need to be able to determine what's a meaningful life to you and have that ability. Um, think back to a credo for support when a couple of the people said, I don't want you to choose what you want for me. I want to choose what I want for me. I want to know, I want to be able to lead a life that I find to be valuable. That's freedom. That's an element of self-determination. Authority is the next element, okay? And that's an individual's ability to exert authority over who will be their support system, money, budgeting, um, to make those goals a reality. 
um, I can look at my budget. In Michigan, we are allowed, you have the authority as an individual with a disability, just like everyone else designs their budget, you get to look at your mental health budget and you have the authority to determine how those dollars will be spent. You have the right to determine who will support you um, in this entire process. They, you can hire your own staff. You can identify who you want to be your direct care staff. You can identify who you want to support you in the community. And of course, with all of this comes responsibility. You have to take responsibility um, for your life and choosing you know, what you want and also the ability um, to be responsible for who's going to hire, fire your staff, um, being fair in that process, because all of this comes with, you know, responsibility. And um, the sooner we teach our children all about self-determination skills um, in their young lives, the better they get at it as adults as well. Again, none of this sounds unique, right? It's just what you would do with anyone um, if you're a parent or a caregiver to someone, you're going to start introducing the concepts of self-determination at a very early age. I'm going to talk a little bit about that before I show you the next clip, but we're going to get through the last two elements, which is five, teamwork. No one's on this journey alone. Self-determination means we have to build a team. We need that team to get us through day-to-day -day living. We need that team to make us be successful. When you think about it, everyone needs a team. You know, you're participating on this webinar in order to get here. It took maybe your family. It took your colleagues to support you, right? It took a team to get you to this moment in time. The last element is commitment. We owe ourselves to be committed to what we want and realizing our goals um, and becoming a self-advocate. Um, and we also, as a group, as professionals in this field, we need to be committed to, to really you know, supporting people in self-determination. And we need to be committed to policies and um, you know, different things that support self-determination for individuals with disabilities. So this is kind of a two-pronged um, element because commitment means personal commitment and it also means professional commitment and it means a societal commitment. I guess it is actually there's three aspects of it. And again next week our presenters are going to get into that a lot more. I'd like to show you the next clip which is um, going to be, oh I'm going to just, I'm going to need Mike's help here. Thank you. And we're going to show you a clip which is on self-determination. I think you'll enjoy it. Minimize this. It's not very long, but I think it's a good one. Self-determination, there we go.
very independent spirit. So I, I, I don't really let people make decisions for me. Self-determination is where a person is able to self-determine their own life and make choices and be independent and being able to hire or fire their own staff. They can be able to do more things without having to be relying on others. I'm one of those examples. Uh, I allow my independent stuff by myself without too much dependency. But there are times that I do need help, like when I need to get better nutrition or better choices in life. The other thing I could say about self-determination is that people get to speak up for their rights and they'll be able to speak up to politically or just in the state. Um, being supportive of yourself and be able to stand up what you be able to um, stand up for what you believe in. Yeah, I like to say it both ways, my team and me. But the the big focus is the person that it's about. You. So the big part of subject determination is the self part, and the self part is you. The concentration is you, because their team is looking at you as the spotlight, as the example of who you are, and continuing to stay healthy the way, not just what they, how they want it, but how you want it. And if you want to be that example and be in the spotlight, we got to show and act like it and know who we are and that we can do it. Because I can do it, you can do it too. That. Um, something out of that um, that's an excellent I think illustration of self-determination by self-advocates and um, that's what we're going to talk about next is advocacy and there are many type of advocates right I mean now we hear that word everywhere it's not just unique to the field of developmental disability it is in Social Security they talk about advocates there are patient advocates in hospitals um, in medical facilities. So an advocate is someone that stands up for you, right? It can be a family member, it can be a professional, they can be a neighbor. It's anyone who is willing to listen to what you're saying and help you get what you need and want. There are professionals that can be advocates. A lot of you that are tuned in today are social workers and I'm sure you're advocates for the people that you support because you help them or you help their families navigate systems, right? And systems can be very complex. And so sometimes people need an advocate to stand up for them. I'm, I'm a social worker and I'm a parent of a young man with developmental and intellectual disabilities. And you know what? I need an advocate sometimes. I need someone who isn't emotionally involved in the same thing that my son Robert and I are in. You know, it might be a school um, something, an issue at school, or it might be um, an issue that's emotional for us. And so I like to have that independent person that's there to represent us and to be listening for things um, in a meeting um, th that I might miss, okay, even as a professional um, or a parent. I need to have that extra independent to stand up for me and Robert and help us get what we need. Another thing that advocates do, besides speaking up for people, um, you can teach people how to stand up for themselves. You can teach them, um, you know, how they can navigate on their own. And they become self-advocates. 
Self-advocates are people that can speak up for themselves and promote their own rights. So the difference between an advocate and a self-advocate is primarily that a self-advocate is the individual themselves, the person with the disability or the family member, who is getting what they need and want on their own. Um, and a regular advocate is someone who supports a person in that process. Self-advocates um, take action for what they believe in. Um, they represent themselves and what they need to others, both professionals or sometimes it can be people out in the community. And a good self-advocate, right, they, we don't give up. We don't give up until we find the acceptable solution. Now there are different ways you can become a self-advocate, um, but first you have to decide exactly what it is that you want. And I always tell self-advocates um, when I'm doing training with them, working with them, um, that you know you have to pick your top couple of items you truly want. If we go into a meeting and we're asking for multiple things, all right, then what often happens is one, we may not get any of the things we ask for, or two, we come away from the meeting getting the item we really didn't want. Okay, so um, an example of that might be if you have a child with a disability and you want them to be fully included um, in their classroom, and you go in and you ask that you ask um, you know for specific classes that your child can be included in, you might be told, well, you can go to gym, you can go to music, and you might be okay with that, but you might leave that meeting without really getting what you want, which is the fully inclusive experience for your child, them being in a regular classroom all day with support. So you have to pick what it is, be willing not to settle, practice how you're going to ask for it. Um, this is a good, this is a tip, okay? Practicing what and how you'll ask for it is good to use in your everyday life because sometimes when we ask for things we sound we don't we come across in a way that we did not intend so practicing how you're asking for things is always a good skill to have um, in life knowing who you should ask find out who's in control find out who's the authority figure and then work with that individual who has the power to make it happen for you know your rights sometimes we can ask and ask but if it's not within our rights, if it's not legislated, if it's not law, it's much more difficult to attain. So you need to, as a self-advocate, learn about disability-related laws. If you are into school inclusion, you're going to want to know about the Individuals with Disability Education Act of 1975. You're going to want to know about a free and appropriate education. You're going to want to know, um, you know, definitions from that law and how they relate to what you want. And then attend training opportunities. Listen to webinars. Go online and you know, get information. Read books. Um, go to training opportunities. DDI has a lot of training opportunities. Um, you can visit our website at ddi.wayne.edu and you'll find out about a lot of the different trainings we do and some of them are related to advocacy skills. Join some of these great organizations, and I could have gone on and on, but I kind of picked some of the most, I think, identifiable ones in our state that do a really exemplary job. The DD Council, the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council, the Regional Inclusive Community Coalitions, the RICS. Um, there are several, um, more than 50 throughout the state. And if you're an individual with a disability and you want to learn more about what's going on in the field, and you want to learn more about being a good advocate, Join your local RIC. You can go online, um, you can Google the Michigan Developmental Disabilities Council and Terry Hunt's name will come up or RICs will come up and Terry does a wonderful job of supporting and facilitating local RICs. Um, the ARC of Michigan does amazing work around advocacy. The Michigan Alliance for Family has trainings on advocacy. Um, the ARCs, your local ARCs, if you're in Oakland County, Macomb County, Wayne County, whatever your county is, your local ARC um, is an excellent resource and has a lot of information available on advocacy. And what's going on? Healthy, both state and metro, um, they do have advocacy. Um, and they employ advocates that say if you're having problems, um, you know, you can contact them. They will support you. They also have, at, um, 
UCP Metro, they have independent facilitators that are available there as well. They can point you in the right direction um, if you're looking for an IAP. Michigan Protection and Advocacy Services Incorporated. They also have professional advocates. Um, and that you can call them at any time during business hours and ask for an advocate. Michigan Partners for Freedom. Um, this is an excellent group by and for individuals with developmental disabilities. We do a lot of work around policy, training, and self-determination. TASH. TASH is an international organization. You can Google it. Um, they, have, they have an annual conference. They also sponsor local events as well. Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered, SAVE, that's a national organization um, that also does a lot in advocacy um, around legislation, but also has a lot on their website about how to be an effective advocate. All right, well, let's talk about person-first language um, at, at this juncture in the presentation. And person-first language is a way of speaking and talking that puts the person first and not the disability. And um, it's because language is something that's very important in the way we communicate. Um, it, it sets the tone of what people are going to see in an individual. So we want to talk about the person first. We don't want to focus on the disability. And I have a little clip I'm going to show you too in a minute when we get through these slides um, that I think illustrates person-first language very, uh, very well. So it's the order um, that you choose your words to describe a person um, and it puts the focus on the person. So it's, it's easy to remember, person-first language. Um, we focus on people, not their diagnoses or their disabilities. And words can sometimes promote stigmas. So I'll choose the word he, okay? And I don't know how many of you know this, but that term came from around the turn of the century when children would stand out on corners and take off their caps and turn that people would walk by, see them, um, and drop coins into their hat. And that's where the term handy capped came from. Um, really. Let's talk more about today and, and the language and what's going on around removing offensive language um, from our vocabulary and also from our legislation that refers to disability. Many of you know Rosa's Law was passed last year. Um, Rosa's Law was promoted by a sibling who decided that he found it very offensive for children and people to be referred to as mentally retarded. That will take all the, that terminology will remove from all federal and state legislation as acts are um, reauthorized. Michigan just recently passed legislation as well, so it will come out of a lot of our state policy. Um, you can play your part in helping make this word extinct by, you know, making sure that when you hear it, you let people know that it is offensive. And by not using it ourselves, we need to take it out of our vernacular. Um, I know that when my, my kids were younger um, and their friends would be in the car or they'd be just you know giggling and talking, doing something in our house, and that word would accidentally slip out, um, they'd right away, they'd, they'd kind of cover their mouth a little bit because they knew that we didn't tolerate that word in our house. And so, um, you can just kind of promote that so that we can one day make that word extinct. I'd like to show you that little clip um, now on person first language. And again, we're going to have more about that um, next week as well. There's my clip. Uh, this is about two minutes, okay? Hi, my name is Michael. Yes, that's me in the middle. I'm an anthropologist and have worked with people who have disabilities for almost five years. I'm here to tell you about something called people first language. You see, rather than calling someone with a disability something like this, you would call them something like this. See the difference? The second one is called people first language 
because it literally puts the people before the disability. This emphasizes personhood before acknowledging the disability. This is important because language tends to shape beliefs about a person's potential needs and desires. In fact, there is an important idea in linguistic anthropology that says, we see and hear and otherwise experience very largely as we do because the language habits of our community predispose certain choices of interpretation. In other words, the language we use influences the way we see people. So, if we identify someone by their disability first, then we might not see the entire person. Using people first language can be hard because we rarely hear it or read it. See? It might feel a little awkward at first, but using people first language quickly becomes a habit and it's something that can truly change the perception of individuals with disabilities so that they may reach all their possibilities. Okay, I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint and wrap up. Um, I, I read how language influences how we perceive people. That is, I believe that is true. And that's why it's so important to use person-first language. And, you know, if we can all be responsible, too, when you see it out in the media, um, or you hear someone on the radio using language that is not person first, you know, make that phone call, shoot them an email. Um, most people don't do things because they're trying to be uh, mean or negative. They just don't know. And so it's, it's us, up to us as advocates in the field um, and people with disabilities to educate our, our community in person first language and I liked you know I think it is true what he said after you use person first language for a while you do start to really um, see it out in, in the media you will recognize it when it's not being used and so we can help promote change in that by being responsible for letting people and educating people in person first language um, you know today's entire presentation was around evidence-based practices practices that have been proven as um, good practices in the literature with research, um, backing it up so that we can get people to this ultimate goal that's on this slide, right? Community inclusion. So it's this combination of things that we learned today that we really want to promote this ultimate goal. Community inclusion is so important. The person-centered plan should be about getting people integrated into the communities that they choose to live with. All people, regardless of how significant their support needs are, okay, should be participating in their community. All people in societies benefit from community inclusion, right? It's diversity that makes our communities very interesting and valuable. Okay, so our reciprocal relationships with people with disabilities enrich in our life as well. Systems theory, which we talked a lot about last week, ecological perspective, and was referenced um, in Beth Blount's presentation today on um, systems and integrating people um, into community, talks about you know identifying who is going to support the individual with a disability. Broaden, pers broaden your perspective in that process, all right? Because the more people are, the more people that are involved. Well, the more that people are involved in their communities and their families, um, it means that they have a happier, higher quality of life. So it's very important um, that we support people in this process. I think we talked about the diversity aspect and the benefits of diverse communities. Costs are sometimes used as a barrier in our process in building meaningful life for people. But they shouldn't be the only consideration, and they shouldn't be used as a barrier. We have to get creative. How can we find additional supports for this individual to make this dream a reality? This process is going to be a creative process, and that's the only way we're going to get to real lives. Okay? Listen to the testimonials. We, we've already shown you two vignettes. Um, in our possibility series, we ask that you visit our website if you'd like to see more stories about how people have, you know, 
use person-centered planning, have used these evidence-based practices to live integrated quality lives in the community. Everyone deserves a quality of life. Everyone. People who have a higher quality of life research will show that they have more inclusive opportunities. All right? They have individualized supports. Um, there's not the pack mentality um, to goals. You know, that everyone goes, you know, because it's convenient, everybody goes to the mall to walk. Um, or everyone goes to this particular church on Sunday because the band is driving there. Individualized supports means people have their own goals and they have a way of attaining um, and that, that means they're individualized goals. And that supports their quality of life. Okay, not the person next to them, but their life. So I want to conclude today's presentation with talking about how all people with disabilities should have the opportunity to attain a quality of life in the community of their choosing. And sometimes this means we have to overcome obstacles and barriers and get creative in that process. Mm -hmm. that, is what, that is what our rule is. And I'm hoping that you know, this webinar series and today's presentation gave you some ideas and, and venues and ways to make those dreams attainable for people. Um, I'm looking at, let's see, I'm going to look at the time here. Okay, we do a show you our last story, which is about Bjorn, who is a person who has an intellectual and developmental disability. It's a part of our possibilities series, and he's living um, a, a fully integrated life in his community up north in Michigan. So we're going to show you that one for questions and answers today. Tell him, and I promised him that his life was going to be extraordinary. I think probably as an infant, I imagined this. Her dream was for him to live in his own place, and so she had this vision of her son living with friends, not in a group home with people that he didn't know. As I recall, introduced the idea was skiing in the lodge, and you know, we're thinking of doing this. What do you think? And and the other family said, yeah. Yeah, that's good. So she just took a leap of faith and built the house and got the funding and had very high expectations about the people that she hired for her son and, and the life that her son was going to live. They have 24-7 uh, staffing, which they must. The staff is amazing. We have very high expectations of them and we love them unconditionally and want to make their job the best job of all. There was a lot of thought and considerations taken in who is going to be in here and how they'll interact together. Tom is definitely the patriarch of the family. So he, things are done. Most of the times he, he's pretty wrapped up in what he does, but then you can see as soon as something goes wrong, as soon as you, if someone's not feeling well, things like that, comes in and kind of hovers and takes care and just has that, that caring, nurturing attitude. Most people down syndrome are really joyful, really happy, outgoing, but not necessarily caregivers. And Tom really is. That's a really neat exam that I've seen. Dan is the really just easygoing guy who wants everybody to be happy. He's always been a runner. Yeah, he loves to run. He runs uh, 5K at uh, the last time at Mackinac Island. And, uh, I'll stop him. Well, he's trying to catch Brenda. I think he lost like 75 pounds and started joining races. And the first race he did was on Mackinac Island. It was 5.7 miles. He did it because I was doing it, and I made it pretty clear that I was going to be competitive and that when it started, I was going to run. And there was a, a staff to run with Dan just to make sure that he knew the way. And actually, he ran so fast, you couldn't keep up. Oh, you know, it'll probably be an hour or two before Danny gets here, so we're just going to like go in and maybe get a cup of coffee. All of a sudden, here comes Danny, and we're like, oh my gosh. And oh, he was so proud. Bjorn is just 
so incredibly cool. He's kind of off and does his own thing and just kind of checks in on the guys here and there. He doesn't have the same interest. Dan and Tom's interests are very similar. And Bjorn is, is more interesting the web. He's interested in physics. He loves anything in the sky. You know, we do a lot of looking at different stars and planets and what's going to come into view. And he loves music. When we first started surfing the web, I think he was in high school in Charlevoix. And he would go to the computer lab and he would stay glued to the web as long as anyone would work it for him, whether it was art or music or uh, checking out Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where his sister lived. He'll have these days where he's just so focused and so clear. And you'll look at a magazine with him, and he doesn't know how to read necessarily, but he can kind of get what each page is. And there's it's when you'll flip to a page, and he'll start to flip to the other one because he's not really paying attention at all. So he puts his hand out, and he'll just stop it. So to see him have his own interaction on his world is a really big thing. Bjorn is truly making choices when he's taking me places. He's always taking me somewhere and showing me things that I haven't taken the time to notice. And that's probably why I look so happy when I'm following him around. North Country Critters started because of Dan's mom, who uh, is a volunteer at AC Paws. She was holding a bake sale and asked if we would bake something in support of the sale. And when I sat down with Dan and Tom, they said, it's for the dogs. We're going to bake dog treats. And many People that bought them came up to me and said we need some more. Their first craft show was that people were kind of walking by and looking, but they'd keep going. And so this woman walks by and kind of glances over and looks at the boys, but she kept going. And Daddy goes, whoops, there goes my favorite customer. And of course she had turned off her back after he said that she bought treats. So now that's I'm like, there's my favorite customer. <laughs> He's a real salesman. So the guys, you know, basically mix and measure and roll out the treats. We have to send each treat in for analysis when we first develop it. And we have to be licensed by the state of Michigan to do this as well. It's starting to be more profitable that they can take bigger trips. They've had the opportunity to be part of their community. They attend church where they have friends. They have a business that they meet people. They grocery shop and their little buddy there. They have a rich full life. The guys don't have to do every single solitary thing together. They have their separate lives where they can go off and do different things and have different choices. Sometimes all three of them will go in a different direction. I feel, as Louise does, that their vocabularies have increased. They are more independent. Self-determination is our motto. I'm just in it for all kids to have amazing lives. They that it takes a village, and I'm definitely part of that village. It is just such a natural thing. You grow up, you get older, you get a job. And I just wish that could happen for people of all abilities, that that's just the natural rhythm of your life. You grow up, you get a job, you move out, you get a place of your own. So I think that we can see that, you know, we do have to dream big and we can't be afraid to dream big and have high expectations. Um, we have to take small and deliberate steps, the resources that we have or find new resources so that we can help people attain a quality of life, a quality of life that they want um, in their community. So that ends today's presentation, although I would like to take, before we open it up for questions, what I would like to do is um, give you the homework assignment. All right, so here's what I'd like you to do for next week. Um, pick one evidence-based practice we talked about today. All right, 150 words or less, answer one of these two questions. Okay, so you can select the question, and it's how will you improve upon your work in the future as a result of learning about this evidence-based practice? Or, as an individual, how will you use the information you learned about one of the evidence-based practices to improve your quality of life? So you can pick either question, um, and you can apply one of the terms that we use today, you know, person-centered planning, self-determination, um, person-first language, whatever that, those, that practice would be, okay? 
and then <clears throat> answer the question in 350 words or less on a piece of paper. You can type it, email it, um, get that to me by Tuesday at 5 o'clock, okay? Now, we're going to change things up a little bit this week. Don't send the homework directly to me, okay? Please send your homework to ddi at wayne.edu. All right, and there Anita will take your work, print it out. We're going to have, then I review it. I'll log it in against your name, and you'll get your credit that way. Um, so that's a change this week. Rather than having you send it to me and then me sending it forward to um, DDI's um, website, I'm going to have you send it directly to that website, okay? So make sure we get it by 5 o'clock on Tuesday um, so that you can get full credit for it. All right, um, that is the end of today's webinar, and I'd like to open it up for questions and answers. All right, the first question Michael's going to answer, it's a technical question. Oh, yes, Laura, you can still fax it in. That's fine. Either fax or email your materials. Um, the as, as Elizabeth mentioned, you can email it to ddi at wayne.edu. Or yes, you can fax it to our fax right. number. It's 313-577-3770. And the other question uh, concerns the video or the video archive of the webinar from last week. Um, yes, the beginning of the webinar, because uh, I started recording it a, a little early, so there's no sound for the first minute or two. If you advanced it, that you'll you'll pick up on when the webinar starts there, the sound is is available on there. Um, if you're still having problems with it, please feel free to email. We can try to troubleshoot it with you. Um, and yes, yeah, the pretest, obviously, if you sent it in already, you're all set with the pretest for this week. If you haven't, you can turn that in with all your materials by Tuesday at 5, uh, as long as everything gets here by that time and we're able to uh, log it and uh, make sure we have your name checked off. And to be honest with you, it actually, it, I mean, for those of you that already sent in your pretest, that's great. Um, we'll log them in, make sure you get credit. But to be honest with you, it is actually, it is easier if you put your pre, your post, your evaluation, and your homework assignment all together in one email and send that forward to ddi at wayne.edu. Um, unless, do unless you do the evaluation online, Mike is reminding me, okay? So that's a little bit different. We certainly do appreciate all of your participation. Are there any questions about any of today's topics? One last thing, the uh, assignment for this week, the post-test, and the presentation itself, and the pre-test are all going to be linked up this afternoon on the webinar archive page. Um, so if you have any trouble getting it from there, again, please email and we can uh, accommodate you that way. Have any of you, I have a question, um, have any of you used, for those of you that are social workers and supports coordinators, have any of you used an independent facilitator in the person-centered planning process? And if you just want to let us know, like a yes, um, and maybe how you found that experience to be, that would be great. Uh, someone's asking for the fax number again. The fax number is 313-577-6, I'm sorry, 313-577-3770. 3770 uh, It's also, we had emailed it before. Let's see. We've got some folks that have used a facilitator. Let's see. Uh, Diane says that she has um, used an independent facilitator. Kathy said she has. Um, and how did you find that experience to be? Either of you, Kathy or Diane? I know sometimes when we're asking the question, it takes a few minutes to get our answer back because you have to type it in. Um, 
Kathleen said she found it difficult um, because the person, unless the person has had good training. So yeah, that is very true, Kathleen, um, that it, you have to have people that are really well trained in that in the process um, so it doesn't complicate your life. Um, Diane found it to make her life easier um, during the person-centered planning process by using an independent facilitator. Um, and that that's, honestly, that's been my experience with supports coordinators I've worked with. Um, but I'm a little prejudiced. It means that we've tr DDI, Angela and I have done the training with our facilitators and we make sure that they do have a good skill set moving forward um, so that they can improve the process. All right, any other questions before we log out today? The idea behind the possibilities videos, uh, the little clips, they're five to seven minutes long. We love for you to use them um, in your work. You, we, the, we love people to use them. That's what they're there for. So please feel free to do that, especially to help you illustrate things um, in your work and, and you work with people with disabilities. Okay, Steve, this is his comment. He did use an independent facilitator and he found it very useful. So good. Thank you to all of you for sharing. And I think today is one of those days we're grateful for distance learning experiences because it took a lot of us a long time to get into our offices. So this is one advantage of doing the webinar. You can log in tomorrow, log on, and get your archived taped version of it for those that couldn't participate live today. And again, we'll be in the same place, same time next week at 10 o'clock. Um, for our next topic and we will have two different speakers next week. That will be um, Chesley Gertz. No, just Michelle. Oh, it's going to be Michelle Driscoll next week. So we're looking forward to, to her presentation and I want to thank you for all of your participation and patience today. Have a good day. Stay warm. The organizer has ended the session. Goodbye.